Yeah, I'm yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, it's great to see so many people here, and also I think we've got over a hundred on Zoom as well, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, for those on Zoom uh, who are logging in, um, you'll be—I think you've been all emailed the slides, so you, so you should be able to follow those slides as you're listening to Greg's uh, lecture here. Uh, at the University, at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, this is our Sh um, Sheffield Institute for Policy Studies annual lecture. It's a public facing lecture, a public lecture. And SIPS, or Sheffield Institute for Policy Studies, started in, in 2016. And in this very room, we had in the very lecture theatre a lecture given by Polly Toynbee on the 15th of June um, 2016, which those with uh, good memories and good knowledge of dates, and that was eight days before the Brexit referendum. And it seemed very auspicious. I think we were all quite optimistic, but a little bit worried about what would happen in the next week and a half. Uh, but we were opti well, optimistic that we would remain. Um, and subsequently, we've had um, uh, lectures from uh, Bob Kerslake, Lord Kerslake, who's also the chair the Board of Governors at, at the University. Um, and my great pleasure today is that we've got a lecture from um, Greg Fell, who's Sheffield's Director of Public Health. Before introducing Greg, I just want to say a, a few sort of housekeeping words, if that's okay. Um, the, the first is, is uh, just to welcome everyone. If, if you are um, feel you want to distance socially, distance, physically distance, um, please do so. Um, we may hear later that numbers of COVID cases are on the rise in, in Sheffield. Um, and also please feel free to wear, to wear a mask. Um, a fire alarm isn't uh, planned, uh, but if, so if there is a fire alarm, we, we, will, we will meet outside the front of the building where I think most of you will come in, so for that side, not on, on, on that side of the building, for that side of the building, where the master point is. Um, before we get underway with the lecture, I also just need to, um, to hand something over to Greg, which is it's my great delight, it's sort of second time that he will receive this, but at his... Um, uh, at the graduation ceremony last November, um, where we graduated the students uh, from um, 2020 and 2021 through a whole series of graduation ceremonies in, in the city. A uh, really exciting time of coming together. Uh, we also awarded a number of honorary doctorates. And one of those is our great delight at the university to award that to, to Greg Fell, for his incredible work and also the work of his team over particularly the last two years in leading the city, leading others through um, the public health crisis, which is the COVID pandemic, but also the work he's done and contributions to public health over a number of decades. So without further ado, I'd like just to hand over and present Greg with the medal and with the, the certificate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm not going to wear the wear the bling <laughs> tonight. I promise that uh, I've not seen the bling actually yet. Mm. The bling light. I shan't. I shan't be wearing it tonight. <laughs> so Thank you. you're welcome. You're more than welcome, Greg. It's our great delight that you can uh, formally do that. Um, Greg's lecture is going to be on um, where and how public health is created and why that matters. Flipping health on its head. And there's an opportunity, the lecture will be, I think, about 30 to 40 minutes. The opportunity for questions. I think we're going to try and manage the questions also. If you've got questions on Zoom, if you post those into chat, we can uh, uh, give those to Greg. But also, if you've got questions in the audience, we'll, there'll be time for questions at the end of, of the lecture. So without further ado, um, I'm going to present Greg Fell to give the sixth annual lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Um, thank you for the, the honour of presenting the lecture. And I've, I've, I've clocked some of the, the big names that you've had in the past. I shall try and live up to that. Um, um, I will not be mentioning the C word at all 
um, you'll be pleased to know. I'm rather sick of it. Um, and uh, nor will I be mentioning those sunlit uplands that we were promised. Um, I'm still looking for them somewhere or other. So uh, um, I shan't mention Brexit too much or at all. Um, so I've got about 30, 40 slides and apologies to the online crowd, T significant technical problems. You can't, you won't be able to see them, but hopefully you've got them. Um, and you can pour over them at your leisure. So um, broadly, five things. I, I'll get, I am the director of public health, so I have to talk a little bit about public health and what, where, how, who, when, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'll talk about the, the, the diagnosis. I should be all a bit medical in this. Of the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the prescription, and then some concluding thoughts. Um, and I'll try. I usually talk quickly, and apologies in advance for that. But uh, um, uh, but if you think I'm going too quickly, someone shout at me, and, and, and you're going to uh, stare at me menacingly when it's when it when when time is up so a bit of background public health in 2022 a bit on bit bit, bit on where, where public health is in local government this is sheffield but most most local authorities are pretty much the same place to be honest um, um it, it's not a service it kind of is a service but it's a function um, and there are four broad things within the function health leadership term used advisedly and as your clock i mean health not health care in this respect, and healthy, whatever health leadership means. If any of you know the answer, let me know, because I'm not sure I do. Um, health improvement, which covers everything from fags, pies, booze, lack of sweat, right the way upstream to the what, what some may call the social determinants of health, so um, poor quality housing, uh, lack of or poor quality jobs, air quality, etc. Um, health intelligence, um, how um, healthy is the population of Sheffield and what does that look like? How do we know? How do we measure it? Health protection, which covers um, communicable diseases um, and outbreaks thereof. And we've been quite busy with one of them for the last two years, but there are plenty of others. You probably noticed the one that we were busy with, um, but there were plenty of others. Um, also covers screening, vaccination, um, uh, very occasionally chemical exposures that impact on the health of the public and very, 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 very occasionally radiological exposure. So the medical detective work, when um, uh, Liv Anienko got pol polonium poisoning, it was, the, it was the public health specialist that did the medical detective work. What, what is it? Where did it come from? How do we stop it? Um, so the radiological stuff you dread because you know, find an expert to phone, but the rest is more, more common. Uh, and still some significant roles around NHS and social care. I have a budget, um, and the budget the budget I've got is 33 million quid. That's what I'm directly responsible for, and that largely buys services: health visitors, school nursing, sexual health services, drug and alcohol services, the smoking police, the fat police. They all do amazing things day in day out, no doubt about that. Um, but he asked my boss, um, um, he he was uh, well, now a she. We'll talk about um, public health as a function. Um, you're there for the city of Sheffield, and you, your your job is to improve the health of Sheffield. That's partly done by the services that you're directly responsible, but actually it's done by the totality of things that happen in Sheffield. So the ask of the council leader and the chief exec, the leader says Sheffield Council is a public health organisation. She, now he, meant it. Sometimes they don't know quite what they mean. My job is to work out how to execute it. But the totality of what Sheffield Council does contributes to our health or, or negatively or positively, influence it for the positive. John and now Kate to, to extend it further. Hey, Greg, your budget is the economy of Sheffield. Influence the way the economy of Sheffield works, please, because everything uh, the co that happens in Sheffield contributes positively or negatively. Go forth and influence it. So that's the kind of the, the playing field. And, and most, most DSPH are in a pretty similar position. So I've got a 17-page job description. I haven't got a clue what all of the words on it mean. I genuinely don't, and neither does my boss. We downloaded it from the internet. Um, but if you were to ask him, uh, he and now she would say three or four things. One, transform public health. It has been NHS-facing. Transform it to local government-facing, because you're never coming out of local government in your working lifetime. Um, public health isn't the grant, but it's the totality of everything that happens in the, in the city. Your job, your duty, is to improve the health of a population, not to provide some services. Thus influence futures that don't yet exist and spend other people's money. Great, it's a liberating place to be. Uh, easy for him to say, difficult to actually execute in practice. And the only thing that you will measure your success by um, is whether you've closed the gap in healthy life expectancy, which I'll come on to in just a second. And that's the only thing that kind of matters. Oh, and write a strategy, and we've got one of those, and I'll bore you with that later. Framing is really, really important. My orientation for, 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 for how I see health is not 
that mighty spectacular institution about half a mile away from here working backwards. My job isn't to reduce health and social care demand, or I've made my own mistake, reduce NHS and social care demand. Um, my, I could do that, um, and if that was the job, I'd have a very, very different set of interventions that's in the toolbox of the person called the Director of Public Health. My job is that working forward. So the inequitable distribution of all of that stuff, poor air quality, crappy childhoods, poor quality housing, and actually the green space looks quite nice, uh, the, but, but it is unequally distributed. So all of that stuff, and then some, creates health. And, and when lots of people talk health, they then talk about the NHS, to which I stop them and say, actually, air quality equals health, poverty equals health. Um, and it kind of completely changes the way and nature of the conversation. So I think that I spend a lot of time on framing. Um, and so how all of those things are unequally distributed is as probably way, way, way more important than IAPT, which is a psychological, uh, psychological therapy service, or prescribing statins to people with high cardiovascular risk, both of which save and change life causes. But those things are arguably much, much more important to health. So if everything's in, how far upstream do you go? Um, the, 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 um, the, the top is the Dalgren and Whitehead model. It's, it's, it's only three decades old, maybe four decades old now. Um, uh, this kind of the, the, the what contributes to health, starting from age, sex, individual constitution, right the way through to kind of socioeconomic, cultural, environmental conditions. So, so in, for my definition of what's in, illness and the delivery of treatment, i.e. what the NHS does is spectacularly important to that and makes a very, very significant difference to the health of the population. Risks and assets, risks obviously, cigarettes, alcohol, tobacco, etc., etc. Assets, um, uh, green space, how much of it, where is it, can we access it? All those things matter. Causes and then causes of causes. If you really, really, really want to get to the heart of why there's a massive gap in healthy life expectancy, let's have a conversation about austerity, neoliberal economic models and what that leads to. Public service spending is in itself a, um, a determinant of health. And the, I use the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the, that picture very frequently. How, mum, mum, how does trickle down e economics work again? Well, firstly, the 1% gets all the money. Um, oh, that's great. And then what? Well, that's it. Um, that is at the heart of the health gap. Um, it's at the heart of lots and lots of other gaps, but that's at the heart of the health gap. So my diagnosis, the four most important pictures in health policy are those, well, I have to stand here because you can't hear otherwise. Um, the gap in healthy life expectancy is top left um, between Door and Darnell. So a baby born in Door tomorrow can expect to get to about 75 in a state of good health and live to about 85, 86, there or thereabouts, um, a seventh of their life in poor health. A baby born in Darnell tomorrow can expect to get to about 50 in a state of good health and expect to live to just below 70, just less than 70. Um, uh, uh, and that's, that's a third of their life in poor health. And remember, they get to about 50 in a state of good health, then that starts to deteriorate. Um, working, age, uh, working age up to 65 or 68, whatever the government tell, it, it tell us it is these days. So a significant chunk of working age is in poor health. Second one is, is a spin on the same thing. Um, Multimorbidity, having more than one thing wrong with you at once. Um, is um, um, more common than unimorbidity, only having one thing wrong with you. It's more common in working age than old people. Um, uh, and if you need the study, read the Barnet uh, Epidemiology of Multimorbidity from the Lancet in 2012. And we've done the same numbers in Sheffield. In fact, those, those are the Sheffield numbers. And there's a, about a 15 year difference in age of onset between the most and the least deprived quintiles, which is a spin on the healthy bit of the healthy life expectancy. Third chart is the stalling of life expectancy. I'll come on to that, but, but that's massive news. Uh, it's, uh, life expectancy is actually beginning to go down in some parts of Sheffield, certainly some parts of the country now. And the fourth is uh, infant mortality, which um, has been going down, but it's beginning to flatline a little bit. And infant mortality, if we want to talk outcomes-based work, um, they, babies dying before their first birthday is about as pointy as they get. Um, Good, good news story in this, this city and lots of other cities, but beginning um, to be worrisome because the rate of improvement is now slowing down. So those are the four most important charts, and none of those will be solved by better NHS delivery alone. They all need to be resolved by things way upstream of the NHS. Context matters. You know this as well as me. Um, the last 10 years in health 
Um, Mike Marmot published his 10 years on report in February 2020. His, his original uh, report on health inequalities was February, 20, uh, February, uh, February, uh, February 2020, uh, 2010. Um, um, he published his 10 years on report in February 2020. Um, spectacularly bad timing because the trouble was brewing. It was coming from Southeast Asia. I'm not going to mention the word. Um, but because of that, it didn't get much bandwidth. Um, but reread my Marmot's report from 2020. Uh, he wasn't very complimentary about our society's progress on narrowing the health gap and what had happened over the, over the previous 10 years. Others have done it since. Ben Barr, who's a Liverpool public health academic, has been in the same space. Uh, impact of local authority spending cuts on life expectancy. Guess what? There's a link. Uh, and Claire Bamber has been, been, been brought, brought, broadly done the same. And uh, Claire, it was Claire that did the, 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 the numbers on life expectancy is now beginning to decrease in some spaces. I've talked about life expectancy. Um, I don't think I'll talk about that further. Um, but the the top line, um, 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 the top the top line is the 2012 um, project ONS projection of life expectancy. You can see 2014, 2016, 2018, 2020 has been kind of mo uh, modelled down ever since. So now we're beginning to see flatlining life expectancy. That's massive news. It's not just happening in Sheffield. It's happening up and down the country. In fact, it's happening internationally in lot in lots of uh, lots of the OECD seven seven uh, OECD countries. So, um, but it is big news and and, and it's definitely happening. Um, so public sector in the last 10 years, 50% smaller um, than it was uh, 10 years ago. The welfare system is much smaller. Um, the, this slide was started from a pandemic slide. We did ignore lot, lot, lots of lessons, lots of, uh, lots of the pandemic exercise lessons. Brexit hollowed out. Uh, uh, but, but the, um, that and Brexit has distracted the civil service and we've hollowed out public health resource, see the IFS stuff. Um, £506 per pounds per person less annual spending power of local government compared to a decade ago that's impacted on every bit of state public sector private sector voluntary community sector faith sector um, and that has consequences largely adult and children's social care has been protected in that i.e fairly flat funding but with very significantly increasing demand so it feels very 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 pressured um, the things that have really taken the brunt planning, welfare, housing budgets, leisure, culture, have taken a big, big hit there. And the, the IFS study, which is referenced at the bottom of the slide, you can get all the gory details uh, should you so choose. Um, I'm on my third pandemic. It won't be my last. I'm sorry to have to tell you there's going to be another. Um, uh, climate and zoonoses, i.e. diseases spread from uh, uh, animals to humans, um, it, it is, is going to happen more and more and more. Uh, I, before you ask, I don't think monkeypox will, will break into the global pandemic. It will probably develop slowly and then s slowly become more stable. But uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 wasn't, uh, wasn't my first pandemic and it certainly won't be my last. Um, give you a sense of scale. Um, SARS-CoV-2, 5 million deaths, 1,400 in Sheffield. It's probably closer to 1,500 now, sadly. HIV was really my first pandemic. Um, so 700,000 deaths last year globally, 40 million over time, none in Sheffield, because um, we've got really, really, really good treatment and a good system for delivering it. Um, swine flu, 18,000 deaths locally. Um, tobacco, uh, let's talk about deaths. Um, so uh, Sheffield, 1,400 people died of COVID, um, 1,000 people died from tobacco every year. This year, next year, year before, year after, um, slowly going down, um, but, but, but smoking is the new smoking. And then the gap, the inequality gap, um, six times the impact in terms of the impact on life and healthy life expectancy than an unmitigated SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And we did a lot to mitigate that, and some of my team are in the room. They know what they did. Um, so, um, but but the, the gap in healthy life expectancy is, more, is six times higher than the unmitigated COVID pandemic. Prognosis, why does it matter? Um, well, the gap matters for social justice. It's an enormous social justice issue. We've heard many, many, many prime ministers standing on the steps of Downing Street telling us that it's a travesty and a social justice issue which shouldn't be tolerated. Well, we've tolerated it for quite a long time, actually, and we're not making that much progress on it. Um, social care, um, when does it go bankrupt? Um, all of the health problems then become NHS demand problems, which then become uh, social care demand problems very, very, very pointy, um, uh, uh, pointy and risky in social care at the moment. It's a significant question when it goes bankrupt. NHS, um, look at what's look at what's happening in the states. 
the, the proportion of GDP spend on the American healthcare system, which admittedly is very different, goes up and up and up and up and up, and the same will happen here. And I don't know how we'll afford bombs and missiles and other important things if we keep spending more on the healthcare system. And economic productivity, lack of health, is a major constraint on economic growth. And uh, 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 Mayor Coppard is talking quite a lot about that at the moment, and he's dead right, and there's plenty of evidence on, on that one, um, which is there, um, and I'm not going to talk about it in the interest of time. Um, Prescription, uh, what to do, what are we doing about some of this stuff? Um, I'll start with some, some, some kind of tightly defined specifics and then I'll work out. And as I say on the slide, there's some good stuff, there's some bad stuff and there's some ugly stuff. Um, and I'll go from early life and infant mortality into poverty and economic policy with one or two detours along the way. Um, firstly, the best, start in, uh, the best start is the best value. Heckman, uh, uh, from an economic perspective, demonstrated that three decades ago. Barker, who was a Bristol epidemiologist, demonstrated the same from kind of an epidemiological perspective. From whatever perspective you look at it, if you want bang for book, um, start pre-birth or very, very, very early in life. Um, and development age 22 months is a really good predictor of all sorts of outcomes at, at 26 years. Um, uh, oddly, we probably under-invest in very early year services given the outcomes that, get, that, that accrue over the life course. Easy for me to say that, hard to, hard, hard to execute change. Um, so, um, but, but, um, uh, and so one might think that we'd be really interested in that, but I don't think we're as interested in it as we ought to be. Two thirds of kids in Sheffield are school ready. A third aren't, and guess what primary school teachers spend a lot of time doing? Um, getting kids ready and able to learn. Well, that's getting them ready and able to learn isn't quite the being ready, be, be, be learning. So um, and that, that two thirds is, uh, like all things, inequitably, spre inequitably spread across the city. Um, not only health stuff, but the totality of emotional, social, environmental issues, etc. So Sheffield has some excellent practice and some areas of attention. So one of the excellent practices is infant feeding. I uh, happened to bump into uh, some colleagues that are doing infant feeding stuff today. Breastfeeding is best. I don't know if you've missed the memo, but it is. Um, uh, we've got breastfeeding rates that compare with nearly the home counties. That hasn't happened by magic. That's happened because a lot of people work bloody hard on it over a long period of time. In terms of um, attunement and attachment, breastfeeding is about as good as it gets. So we have some really, really good stuff, but also some things to attend to. Um, school readiness is, is one of them, but there are plenty of others. Um, and some of that stuff has clearly gone um, awry over the course of the last two years, as has everything else. So we kind of need to get, get our shoulder back behind the wheel in some of that regard. Infant mortality, I mentioned it earlier, is the dog that doesn't bark. Um, two decades ago, um, um, we had really quite high rates of infant mortality compared to the, compared to the national average, which is the uh, left-hand end of that chart. A decade ago, again, we were on the naughty step. Um, Sheffield wasn't doing very well, and we didn't have a clear and coherent strategy. Um, we reassessed our evidence base. We reassessed our... Uh, our um, uh, uh, implementation of programs, and we put together a strategy with five or six programs within. One was infant mortality, uh, infant uh, feeding, uh, 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 safe sleep, um, uh, um, cot, cot death, um, smoking and pregnancy, um, and a range of other things. We halved the number of uh, infant deaths over that over the last ten years, just about. Um, uh, yeah, maybe not quite halved, but we're getting close to halving it, and we closed the gap. You don't hear about it um, because. Who can count prevention? Um, but, 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 but it's definitely a success story. I wrote a little bit about it in The Telegraph about two or three months ago. You can read it at your, at your leisure. Um, but as I say, if you look at the most recent data, the numbers are now beginning to, the kind of historic improvements now begin to flatline. So some cause for concern going forward. Um, smoking is the new smoking. Um, uh, it will soon be overtaken by obesity, but just about it's the new smoking. Um, Again, we are doing pretty well, actually. Um, it does cause 20% of all deaths. It causes about 15% of all illness. Um, very heavily weighted in more socioeconomically deprived populations, um, black and Asian populations, um, those with a severe mental illness. And guess what? That causes uh, leads to exacerbation of the health gap overall. Um, got a pretty good strategy. Um, I took money out of stop smoking services and put money into trading standards about five years ago. Um, why would we fund trading standards? Um, well, um, illegal and illicit tobacco is on sale at 1980s prices in ones and twos for kids in a lot of Sheffield, and it's really, really easy to get hold of. 
five kids a day start smoking, they become lifelong smokers, um, and, they're, they, they're, they're, and half of them are going to be killed, um, preceded by quite a long period of horrible, horrible illness. My dad died of lung cancer. It's horrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Um, so we, we, we fund trading standards, and they kick doors down, sometimes mostly in eastern Sheffield, confiscating enormous quantities of illegal cigarettes. Interestingly, they find all sorts of interesting links to illegal drug supply, organized crime, modern slavery. So the police become interested, social care become interested. So um, by doing that, we've generated all sorts of spin-off and ancillary benefits. Now, I didn't think that would happen, but it did. But all up, the strategy has led to, again, smoking prevalence rates that compete with the East Riding of Yorkshire, and they're a lot posher than us. Um, so uh, there are some success stories. I do drone on about the, di the difficult negative stuff from time to time, but, uh, but there are some success stories. Obesity, less successful. It's nearly the new smoking. 300,000 people in Sheffield uh, are uh, over overweight or obese. Um, uh, and with kids, uh, which is the graph with the sharp uptick, it went up quite significantly during the course of the pandemic. Um, so, um, uh, and that's the, the, there's a gap again, as there is in all of these things, um, between the, 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 the most and the least deprived. But whether or not the obesity went up quite at that uptick, I'm not sure. I think there were some data artifact issues to do with the way the data was collected during the pandemic. But um, it's a big thing, sick term used advisedly. Um, it's nearly the new smoking. Um, uh, but it isn't going to be solved by me investing in weight management services for overweight individuals. Um, if I were to do only that, it would take me 700 years to solve the obesity because, sadly, weight management isn't as effective as any of us wanted to be. You know, you see those things on the back of the bus. This was me before with my... my the, that's one in a thousand. So most, m most people don't lose much weight. Some lose a little bit and it's hard to keep it off. Uh, so our intervention is focused, if you've never read it, read the Foresight Report on obesity. It's, uh, it's quite old now, but uh, what we do around the environment, commercial and economic and social environment, um, and the physical environment has as much impact on obesity as uh, 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 weight management per se. So we do have a strategy. We do not have an obesity strategy. We have a food and well-being strategy and a move more strategy. Uh, credit to Prof. Rob Copeland in particular, who's led the move more strategy amazingly well over quite a long time now. And Anna, I don't know if Anna's in the audience, but Anna's, Anna's taken on that mantle, Anna Lowe. Uh, so there's sort of the, 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 the chunks of stuff within the, the move more strategy at the right hand of the slide and the chunks of stuff within the um, um, uh, food and well-being strategy on the left hand, uh, left hand uh, end of the slide. Um, that's a set of activities and you won't know about most of that stuff because you all think obesity is something to do with weight management. We'll send people to Slimmer's World. Um, yeah, we do do a bit of that. But what we actually do is way, way, way more upstream than that. Um, and sometimes that's my worst problem. Putting your finger on the, the, the what it is you do do uh, is quite difficult because I hate answering the what. what so, so what are you doing to, to, to solve obesity in the pub? Um, because it's kind of hard and people want me to say, oh, I just have loads of slim as well. But no, it's much, much more complex than that. Um, I can't talk about obesity and cigarettes without talking about the commercial determinants of health. If you really, really, really want to know why we smoke too much, drink too much, and are overweight, read, read about the commercial influences on our health. That's why um, two-thirds of us are overweight or living with obesity. Our fundamental biology hasn't changed in the last three, four, five decades or so. Um, the, 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 our occupational activity has... Um, we tend to have less physically active occupations. Our leisure activity hasn't fundamentally changed that much. Sadly, I uh, wish it had. Um, that's the real reason. Uh, it's the activities of companies that want to sell us too much junk, but bluntly. Um, so, um, so if you really, really, really want to understand why uh, we smoke too much, drink too much, eat the wrong, thing, eat the wrong sorts of food, read about the political determinants of health and the lobbyists. Um, if you don't know, well, you'll know one of those two people, hopefully, um, but, but the other one is Linton, Linton Crosby, who's a uh, tobacco industry lobbyist. Um, uh, very, 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 very good at his job. Um, uh, and that has consequences on the decision that the bloke on the right makes. Um, uh, the U-turn on uh, junk food advertising possibly is an example of that. Don't know, but I'm suggesting it is. Um, so kind of getting to grips with the tactics that are used in that space is kind of important. Um, and if you want to look on the tactics, I'd encourage you to read Virgins of Doubt, which was written largely about petrochemicals and, and global warming and the tactics of the oil industry. Um, but you can apply all of the same stuff to tobacco, alcohol, food, 
gambling I'll come on to in a minute. Um, uh, and they use deliberate and willful strategies to frame people like me as the nanny state gone mad, interfering in people's lives, etc. Um, the free market will shape, our, shape the answers here. Well, the free market led to us burning the planet. Um, uh, I'm not convinced that's good for us in any way, shape or form. So um, a massive investment in some of those industries to shape the choices that we make. So can, that does matter. Um, you've seen the graph. Um, the, 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 the red in the east of Sheffield is where most of the poor health is. That's my profit loss account. And most of it comes from the activities of corporations, which is that that's that's the food sector. But equally, I could say the same about alcohol. Um, those companies need to make a profit. I do not deny that for a minute. But the consequence of that profit is my red in the east of Sheffield. And that has consequence. Society, individuals and the economy bear the consequence of that. Your kids aren't making free choices on gambling. Um, uh, uh, if, if you want to get into the, I've put some links at the bottom, one of which is the Faculty of Public Health and the ADPH statement on, on harmful gambling. Um, uh, DCMS are about to review the, the review, publish the review of the Gambling Act and we remain to see what's in it. Um, but gambling has huge industry influence, um, huge um, uh, um, uh, investment in uh, advertising and product placement, um, front of football strips, uh, you only need to watch telly at the, in late night. Um, a very, very, very strong influence over policy making. All of that shapes the gambling choices that our young people and our adults make. And that comes with harm, which takes me back to my red bit of my profit loss account there. What lies upstream of all of that? Poverty, Pl bluntly, and I'll come on to poverty, poverty in a minute. This is my Marmot slide. Um, so if we, if, if we were to um, enact the, the live well diet, you'll all have seen it, which is the eat, eat more carrots and less pies, basically. Um, there's a, uh, sorry to the nutritional scientists in the room, but there's a whole bunch of complexity within that, but that's basically what it is. If you're to enact on that, those at the bottom end of the income spread, those at the, in the bottom decile would need to spend 75% of their income to eat that, um, um, uh, and people have to make choices. They've also got to heat their house, which is equally difficult, etc. So some tricky stuff there. Um, so 25% um, 20, of Sheffielders live in poverty, 55% um, in some parts of town in 2022. Um, if you've never read it, I'd encourage you to read Philip Alston's report, who was the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty, came, came to write a report on the UK government's approach to poverty. He didn't write, some, he didn't write the terribly kind things, it must be said. Um, so the city is sort of aligning itself now. We've just, well, not fair to say we've not done anything on poverty over the years. We've done plenty, but clearly cost of living crisis is a big thing right now. So kind of we're aligning ourselves, and those are some of, some of the things that we're doing and can pick, pick up pick up on, on, on some of those. But um, 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 it's fair to say that many of the answers to poverty lie in Whitehall, not the town hall. And so we're doing our best in some quite difficult circumstances. Um, the air that you are breathing now um, is not safe. It's probably legal, but it's not safe. And it might, may or may not be legal. I don't know what the numbers are today. Um, the clean air zone per se won't solve the problem. Um, uh, we'll need much, much more than the clean air zone. And I've noticed Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester is kind of rolling back on um, a clean air zone, which is a sort of a, um, you, if you've got an older, more polluting car, you're going to need to pay to come into central Manchester. Um, so that, and then he's, he's basically shifting his narrative towards um, incentives uh, to, for people to switch to more, more modern cleaning cars, preferably get on the bike. Um, um, and, and, and all of those things are going to be needed. A smallest number of low traffic neighbors, really important though they will be, definitely, and all of the evaluation is beginning to bear that out, not going to be enough. Um, 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 and there's lots of lobbying against improvements to air quality. It's a tax on the poor, which is one of the key lines in Greater Manchester. Um, we can't afford to or don't want to upgrade our fleet. So we need to, we're going to need to help people upgrade fleets. Um, um, but make no mistake, air, poor air quality kills people. Zero, zero doubt on that. Possibly not quite at the same level of t as cigarettes, but it does kill people. Um, so, and obviously government actions in different departments mitigate again. So fuel duty cuts, we need to make it cheap uh, to drive because we're in a cost of living crisis. Get it, understand it, that the more we make it cheap to drive, the more people drive, therefore the air quality becomes poorer. Um, Her Majesty's Treasury offer £15 billion a year subsidy to fossil fuel companies. £15 billion pounds a year. Um, the planet is burning. Um, I'll leave that thought there with you. Um, and obviously companies lie about the impact of emissions. Uh, the link in the slide talks about the, the, the health 
consequence of Volkswagen lying about um, um, emissions. So um, we've said in Sheffield, one of the key points of our strategy is nobody should have a home detrimental to their health. By definition, that means solving homelessness. Um, we made great progress in homelessness, actually, during the course of the, um, the period of the last two years where the, the, there was the, the thing I cannot name. Um, but we're beginning to slip back on that. We invested heavily in that. Um, and that was government investment. Thank you to government for it. We, we did make great progress in terms of getting people off the streets and giving people more secure tenancies. Beginning to slip back on that. But we've also get in, got to get into the business of um, um, poor, quality, poor quality homes, particularly the private rented sector, cold homes, damp homes, homes that are um, where the tenancy is just, just, just um, very, very insecure, um, unaffordable homes. All of that stuff needs to be attended to if we want to achieve our objective. And uh, there's a huge amount of intervention in various parts of um, the council, among social landlords and elsewhere. But, but it's a big chunk of work. And I think that's I'd probably say it's work in, work in progress. Scotland, um, it's not the booze, it's not the pies and cigs, though it might be the booze that causes um, uh, ex the excess mortality, this is particularly Glasgow. Um, this was something done by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health about four or five years ago, um, looking at excess mortality in Scotland. But the, the, the TDLR is the planning social and economic policy saves lives. Um, what happened in the 50s was the closure of the shipyards. Um, at that time, we moved everybody out to Cumbernauld and places like that. I went on holiday to Cumbernauld once. It, I, I, I wouldn't go back. Um, so um, it was all right. I was in the countryside just outside Cumbernauld. Um, so, um, but, but we've moved people to new towns with no social structure. Um, and we shifted people from, from uh, close-knit communities to, to flats in new-built towns with no community facilities and not much else. As a result, um, uh, that led to significant health consequences. So planners save lives by what they do, and they probably underappreciate that, actually. Um, uh, I'm going to skip because I'm more conscious of time. Um, so I, I didn't talk about a whole bunch of other stuff. Leisure, how I did talk a little bit about housing, welfare system, transport policy, children's services. All of those things matter to our well-being. All of those things matter to our health. Um, and it's worth you looking at, particularly the YouTube clip at the, at the bottom there, which is Harry Burns, ex-chief medical officer for Scotland, talks about salutogenesis um, um, and uh, how we work with, our com with and through our communities to maximise the assets that are already there within our communities, to, which is very, very, very untapped space, actually, in, in, um, in uh, some aspects of health policy. We try, we try our best, but sometimes don't always succeed. So, um, nearly done. Tying it all together, who's accountable for health and well-being? Who's accountable for healthy life expectancy in Sheffield? I often ask that question, and most people then stare at me. Um, um, uh, uh, and I tend to try and look at the floor or something. Um, so, um, but it's a it's a good question to ask, and it's a bloody difficult question to answer because you've said I've seen that I've, hopefully I've demonstrated that basically everything's in. I don't have control over all of that stuff by a long stretch. Um, so, um, um, it's a collective job, but 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 ultimately someone has to be accountable. Um, we do have a strategy. Um, for health, it's called the health and well-being strategy, and his goal is to close the gap in healthy life expectancy. And there are kind of ten, ten, ten chunks which are which are which are there. Um, and I'll pick on, I'll pick on housing and neighbourhoods. The the ambition is that um, nobody should live in a home that's detrimental to their health. To their health, but there's an enormous chunk of stuff within that can't be commanded and controlled from the town hall. It's a sort of a social mission and social enterprise. In the same way that the levelling up missions are a, a mission. Uh, and and I, don't, I, I couldn't write a plan to say, what am I going to do on Smith Street in Darnall in 2034? I haven't got a clue what I'm going to do on Smith Street in Darnall in 2034, but setting out some principles is where I think we, we are currently. So it takes me back to the point, and they've seen the slide, so I won't dwell. Um, the city has plenty of powers. Um, 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 but the government frequently asks people like me, what powers would you like, Greg? Um, and quite honestly, I'm not sure I want more powers. I would like resources to execute the powers I've got because powers without resources to execute them aren't much use, actually. So um, powers to enforce 
I need people to enforce with the powers that they've got. Um, so, but we have plenty of powers. Um, the two that I kind of pick on particularly, the 2000, 2000 duty to, to promote well-being, um, un underplayed really quite significantly. Um, bear in mind the context that local places have been in since, since uh, for the last uh, the decade and a bit now, um, and the power of competence, um, which I think the lawyers will tell me differently. I think means local authorities can do anything but declare war. Um, so sometimes we do that as well, um, but um, but 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 we, sometimes we don't need more powers. We need more connectivity between the different bits of our institutions. And actually, as I said at the bottom of the slide, we probably need a lot more con connectivity um, across um, all government departments. The Department of Health and Social Care can't solve health. The government can make pro possibly can't solve health, but can make a great deal of progress by being connected and embedding health in all of the policies across all of the government departments. I've listed some of them there. Um, there's no single thing. The big idea is that there isn't a big idea. I don't have enough staff. You don't have enough staff. It's not a one-person job. It's definitely not a place for heroes, um, a hero model of leadership. It's all about systems and distributed leadership. I don't think you can command and control your way through that. Just as the pandemic taught us, um, there isn't a big red button on the side of my desk. I press and everything works. It worked because of um, a principles-based approach to these kinds of things um, and a dynamic approach because you, you, I didn't know how it was going to play out on the 13th of March 2020. We had some principles and we lived them and we, we, we acted upon them dynamically. It absolutely depends on relationships and trust within, with, with people. So, yeah, we have principles. We've got a strategy. We haven't really got a plan. Um, for how we do some of these big major challenges. Um, and I do think we need to take great care on medicalizing some of this stuff. Talk health, begin to think about doctors, nurses, medicalizing. How many statins can we prescribe in Darnall, et cetera? Not going to solve the health problems. Uh, ditto, we're not going to solve um, some of the fundamental problems by focusing only on individuals. We do need to focus on individuals and help support, empower, enable, et cetera. But, but we, can't, um, we can't empower people to um, solve grinding poverty. Um, we need to focus on the structural determinants, which are way upstream of individuals. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the why it matters bit, and then I'm going to do a little finish, finish with a little bit of the so what. How health framed, how health is framed is matters. Um, um, and the, uh, the, the sort of, we really, really need to get our eyes put a lot of time and energy in getting that right. And if you want to read, I'd encourage you to read those two things by the Health Foundation on the bottom of the slide. Um, so health is not the NHS. The NHS is a hugely important social institution, does amazingly good things, saved the life of my son. I'd be forever grateful for that. Um, but it will not solve that which is uh, uh, some kids in some pretty pretty poor quality looking housing. So uh, it's, a, it's a societal endeavor and we need to kind of get the framing right. Uh, that article is a, is a spin on the same thing, so I won't, I won't tread on it. Um, health is not on the balance sheet. Um, uh, it's needed for a prosperous economy, it's needed for social justice, and that's a two-way relationship. Um, so um, my, one of my missions is getting health onto the city's balance sheet and getting it out of a single silo and getting it into the, 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 way, of the, the way that the city operates. Um, um, Saving Gotham was a really, really good example of how that happened in New York, which was the relationship between Tom Frieden, who was the uh, commissioner for health, aka someone vaguely like me, um, and Mayor Bloomberg at the time. To be fair, Bloomberg had a lot of money and I think he splashed it around, so that did make a difference. Um, uh, and secondly is Bruce Katz, the Metro Revolution, which is kind of about the power of cities to do socially useful things. Um, both of those two are sort of guiding, guiding, guiding principles for me. So my five take home messages, the sort of why it matters. Um, it's definitely needed for a vibrant economy society. Um, uh, it's definitely not a cost strain to NHS and social care, but if you get it wrong, it is a cost strain to NHS and social care. I can't be an expert in everything. I certainly can't control it. Um, there's zero doubt I can control it or write a plan for what we're going to do. If I did, it'd be yay thick and you'd never read it. Um, um, it's not the NHS, nor is it a department. It's an organizational responsibility. Um, I've said that um, health isn't the NHS. What the NHS does makes up about 20% of the answer. So make that bit count. But we do spend large chunks of NHS pound buying back the consequences of policy choices made in, in, other, in other arenas. Um, and most health is done by people who don't have the word health in their job title. Um, last slide, the four biggest risks to health, you all expect me to then say cigarettes and alcohol, 
um, and, and too little exercise and all that kind of stuff. Um, taking it way back upstream, those four. Neoliberal economic thinking and ideology, and the, re the references are at the bottom and can challenge me if you disagree. I, I hope you do disagree, actually. So the privatization of profit and the socialization of risk, um, that creates inequality. Um, uh, that, that in itself creates inequality. The influence of commercial actors in determining public health policy in, in their interests, not the interests of the health of the public. Um, um, I encourage you to go and read stuff about tobacco control or uh, fast food industry. Um, public sector finances in themselves are a determinant of how healthy the population is. Um, read some of the some of the references further further up. And the hegemony of medicine. I was reminded by a medical sociologist who was also a practicing surgeon who taught me about this way back in the 1990s. I think it was way back. Um, um, Health, NHS is only a partial answer. The NHS spends enormous sums of money on gizmos that don't do a great deal of good. I could probably count up 200 million pounds worth of NHS spend in Sheffield that doesn't do a great deal of population good. Some of it does a great deal of individual benefit, but it doesn't do net good for population. Ditto rescuing people. Um, we spend enormous sums of money on people at the very, very, very end stages of life to keep them alive for another couple of days sometimes. That has opportunity costs. I don't doubt that if, when it's my gram, I might want it as well, or when it's my turn, I might want it as well. But we need to be mindful of the opportunity cost of that. And the very word health has an ownership problem, not the NHS, something way upstream. So uh, back to my job description, uh, uh, reinventing a city for about 570,000 people where health and inequality was a key criterion, and um, basically healthy cities reborn, and definitely more than fags and bananas. Um, although I do do a bit about fags and bananas. So um, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to um, open up for questions and comments and whatnot. Greg, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I think what we'll do is we'll, if, if I may, we'll take some questions from the audience here and then we'll gather the questions good, good that plan. are coming in. Take the pressure off Eloise. <laughs> take the pressure off Eloise. Um, <laughs> So please have questions in the room. Um, please, sir. Yeah. And if you can, just say your name. Some of you, Greg probably knows half of you here already. Or more Not than many, half. to be honest. Huh? Not many, to be okay. honest. Anyway, anyway, thanks a lot. Chris Cutforth. I'm an academic in sport. Um, I hope this question doesn't put you on the spot. Um, there's two questions in one. Always do it. Um, Pen out. I think of local authorities. I think of them as community leaders placemakers, service providers, and enablers. Um, I suppose my question is, do you agree with that? Yes. Uh, basic description? And my, more to the question is, where is Sheffield City Council on that spectrum, if that's the right word? Is it in the right place? Is it moving to um, the right place? And how does the local politics affect your work? So, um... So um, on the, 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 I think all local authorities are all, all of those things, and we do, we do them all to a lesser or greater extent, and that varies from local authority to local authority. I suppose it's losing the title local, and it does, it does vary. Um, um, I think we've probably uh, been in the space of service provider um, rather than enabler and community leader. Um, I think we as an institution want to be more in that space. We can't not be a service provider, but to be fair, there are services that, that others can provide probably better, actually, um, and lots of on-screen commuter services can get to places that statutory services just can't get to. Um, so I think we probably want to be in a place where we um, um, emphasize the uh, empower empowerer enabler place shaper and place maker type of roles and be better at that um, um i guess we've been okay at it in the past but we want to be better um the the dawn of the committee system so we're in a very very new space politically that will take some time to bed down um, er, my early thought is, is that it will lead to a fundamentally different form of politics a more collegiate form of politics and politics matters it really 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 matters that the the, the Political decisions determine how healthy we are or not, by and large. And Mike Marmot says that very, very, very frequently. Um, so um, very, very early reflections on the committee system thus far, I think, is, 
I think is it, it will take some time to bed down, and it, of course, will be difficult, and, uh, uh, and there'll be some problems and turbulence along the way. Um, but I think it will lead, and I hope it will lead, but I think it will lead to a fundamentally different form of politics, which will be a lot more collegiate and collaborative. We've got to kind of set that dream out and live that dream, which is easier said than done, but that's where I think we'll end up. Hey, up. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I'd, I'd sense, I can't speak on our behalf of either of the two universities, I'd sense they, they, they do okay in that, but would want to do better and, and, and maybe a bit of a, a sharp stick from various people to help the institutions do better. As does my own institution, we know, I know we can do better. Um, but the question on the universities, uh, y yes, I think there will be some really good stuff going on across both of the universities, and I'll talk about one specific, one specific in, in a minute. Um, but, 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 but needs to be a bit more institutionalised across the totality of the institutions. And I think there's more. I think it's a sort of a see me after class type of territory. The specific I pick up because it's one I do know moderately well is the social accountability in medicine project, which is run by the medical school of the University of, um, and they, they they send their I think third year medical students out to volunteering community organisations across the city. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, so and Debbie Matthews tell, tells this story, and she said, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, um, she had a few medical students that, 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 that came, and they're bright, shiny people. Um, they, Debbie said, we worked them really hard. Um, they came wanting to be neurosurgeons. They left wanting to be social workers. So that project fundamentally provided a useful pair of hands to, um, the, to, to Debbie and Manor and Castle Development Trust. Um, but sort of change the shape of those medical students' careers and, 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 and kind of put, put them in a different direction. Uh, aggregate that up over a long time and a, and a lot of students, that begins to change the way that, that, that people think. Got to turn that into, change that into the way, sorry, shift that into the way that institutions think as well. It's easy for one bit of one institution to do well, even so it's not that easy, but, and that bit needs support, needs a bit of managerial effort, needs a bit of executive effort. Um, and I'd, I'd sense that, that all big institutions, mine included, are okay at that, but could do better. Um, I just think that's a really good question as well, and the answer was really He's, he's good always good at hard questions. Then the blue top. Hang on. Um, it might depress kids, to be honest. Um, I'd be perhaps a bit careful about delivering the message quite as bluntly as that. Um, what what I, I'm, I, I'm always loath to do with regard to sort of school-based stuff is do health education. You, 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 you pull up and you give a lecture about why smoking is bad for you and all that kind of stuff. Um, try and shift the environment in which kids are at school. Um, and so we um, uh, not actively shied away from um, um, investing in school-based education, but we've spent more time and energy, uh, think of an example. So um, we, we don't do anything in schools with regard to diet and nutrition education. We do plenty in schools with regard to the nutritional standard and quality of the food that's given, both from a sort of a nutritional perspective, fats and sugars and, and all that kind of stuff, but also from a carbon um, perspective. Um, so you're kind of trying to shift the environment in which kids are there rather than kind of me finger wagging and giving lectures. Um, all that said, well, I can still remember when, when, when the cop came to do the drugs talk in my school with his suitcase full of drugs paraphernalia, I can still remember it. And whether it changed my behaviour, I don't know. It probably didn't, to be honest, but I can remember it. It was memorable. I think I might, just because to, to keep audience uh, participation on Zoom for a bit, um, we'll go over to some of the Zoom questions. Yeah. Um, so Faye uh, um, says... Uh, Eloise, if you read them out, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, that's we'll, fine. We'll take, yeah. uh, so Faye says, thank you for including gambling harms as a threat to public health. What are your thoughts and hope for the upcoming white paper? Um, so my, my fear is no substantial change. 
um, Faye. Um, I, well, I hope I live to be wrong, um, but, but my fear is not much substantial change. My, my hope um, is that a significant shift, of, uh, a shift away from industry influence in the policy making and service delivery space um, and there's a lot of it at the moment. Um, it's kind of like, would, would we see it as okay that British American tobacco was setting tobacco control policy? No, probably not, to be honest. But that's seen as okay in this space, and I, I don't think it is. Um, so that's thing, hope one. Um, hope two is there's a lot of emphasis on the statutory levy. So currently we have something called the mandatory levy, which is nearly a pay-as-you-go type of mechanism for, for, for industry. Um, uh, lots of people are lobbying for the statutory levy, which, which would raise significant sums of money. Um, my, there's some small print and some caveats for me on the levy, one of which is how much will there be? Secondly, is what you spend it on. If we spend it all on treatments, that's not to say that we don't need better treatment, because we do, definitely, um, but that doesn't solve the population problem. That helps individuals who are currently addicted to gambling. It doesn't, 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 shift, the, uh, doesn't shift the sort of the, 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 the in-pipe, for want of, a better, want of a better phrase, or the, in, the incident harm. Um, so, um, um, and the, who's in control of it? Um, if we don't solve the... Is, is there undue gambling industry influence, then, then it's kind of a circular economy. It's not what I think we meant by a circular economy either. Um, and the third is the um, significant shift on advertising, sponsorship, marketing, promotion, product placement. Um, um, the, the spent, there's half, uh, hang on, let me get this right, half a billion pound a year spent on um, uh, gambling advertising. Um, Industry is smart. They don't spend that given then and know there'd be no impact on behavior. There's an enormous impact on behavior. Um, the behavior then translates to harm, sadly, for some. And the first, so, so I think we do need significant shift on that. And the fourth space I think we need some shift on um, is um, yeah, clearly there is a, a, a need for um, specific um, uh, product regulation and a kind of regulation of the industry. But if you focus your energy on specific products, the, the spin speed on slot machines, for instance, um, industry will be 15 steps ahead of you. I think we need to kind of step three or, three or four steps ahead of that um, and talk about framework, framework agreement that covers the totality of product and industry regulation in the same way that we've got the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, it is illegal for, um, a, for, for governments to involve and include tobacco industry in, um, in policy formation and implementation. Uh, and government have agreed to that as part of the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, I'd want the same in this space. So long answer, but hopefully that gets close to, where, to, 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 to my thinking. Next one. Yeah, the next one's from Tilly, and she says, thanks for a really interesting talk. How can we better address the under-resourced care sector, particularly in the context of an aging population? Um, I don't know is the short answer, Tilly. Um, for, for, for we've been promising to fix social care once and for all for about the last four decades. And, um, um, and, and, and well, we haven't fixed it yet, uh, live in hope. Um, if we really, really, really want to fix social care, we would need an, an enormous investment. What I don't think we need is to nationalize social care, a national care service akin to the National Health Service. Um, I'm not sure personally that's the answer, um, uh, and uh, people then press me on press me on why. Um, I, I think it, it leads to um, more mechanistic delivery of social care, and there's a, probably a need for some mechan for some mechanism. But it kind of de de it will de you end up dehumanising social care, and I'm not sure that's a good thing to do. Places need to feel that they've got skin in the game here. Individuals need to feel they've got skin in the game. If we really, really want to fix social care once and for all, we need to invest in it at really quite industrial quantities for quite some considerable period of time. Um, and a slight um, aside, uh, Tilly, um, the it, it's not an ageing population; it's a poorly population. A ageing is the thing here is how healthy or not people are that then has obviously um, NHS consequences people need, need, need and get quite rightly treatment and then then social care is downstream of that that's to do with poorliness not aging per se um, back to my multimorbidity chart which is kind of having more than one thing wrong with you um, um, the, 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 um, the, there's a sort of a socioeconomic um, distribution of that that's at the heart of it not necessarily the aging of the population per se Take a couple of more online and then yeah. a couple, a couple more in the room. More yeah, uh, so Galaxy A41, 
which I presume is a phone, not a name. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about Han Solo earlier. Uh, how do you feel about public health being responsible for everything? Uh, well, it makes me really nervous because um, I'm not sure that we could or should. So someone with the term public and health in their job title could or should be responsible for everything. Um, I, so I talked a little bit about poor quality housing. It's a particular issue in the private rented sector, not just the private rented sector, but a particular issue there. Um, I don't know much about that, to be honest, and I'm not best placed to know about that. There are plenty of people in Sheffield who do know an awful lot about that. Um, so it's the sort of the, I don't think the model of, single leader being in charge of everything is the right answer for these thorny, complex, wicked issues. I think it's a sort of a distributed, disseminated leadership where um, where all of the agencies and actors in a city um, share the, the, the problem and different people have got different things to contribute to the party. So I, I'm trying to avoid, if at all possible, being responsible for everything. Um, Another one? one more. Yeah. yeah on so Jess says, great, clear talk, thank you. How does Sheffield handle linking data across sectors? Mm. Where I am, Aberdeen, many people with excellent intentions are thwarted by an inability to link and share data. NHS does this fairly well, but very tricky to link across social care and education. How does Sheffield share data and analysis? Um, not half as well as we ought to, to be honest. Um, I'm a, a huge, uh, huge believer in the power of linked data sets and uh, big data um, so um, um, not half as well as we might and some of that is to do with risk aversion actually I think if you ask Bob from Burngreave the man on the street test or the woman on the street test they'd say oh don't you share data um, and we don't um, but we're too risk averse there's, there's some technical stuff about um, our ability to sort of you know, actually link it, what's the, co what's the common linking factor um, and, and how, how we might do that. The technical problems are probably fairly easy to solve. Um, the real problems are um, our um, aversion to risk uh, and actually not sharing data um, within, never mind across sectors, but, uh, but, but certainly across sectors also carries risks because we, we don't spot stuff and we're over-reliant on individuals to spot things and to kind of spot trends in the way that some indicators are unhelpfully developing, going in the wrong way. Um, the more we can link data to better, the more we can link data together, the better, and we're less reliant on the the um, the, the variables and whether or not skilled individuals will spot stuff. Sometimes they do, and I'm not saying skilled individuals aren't important; they are. Um, but but kind of the ability and uh, the power to to link data together, we're not as good as as we need to be by some considerable distance. Thanks. Very much. Very. I'm going to take one one final question. I think from the audience and Wonder Green. Thank you. Andrew, thank you. Great talk. Um, I'm I'm coming from a mental health perspective for children. I'm a children's emotional and behavioural psychologist. Um, and a lot of the things that you talk about with health, I can't help but feel a room with people with, with mental health mm. issues. Is the priority for children's mental health in Sheffield so that we can try and break this cross-generational impact that we're seeing? Um, in, in theory, in practice, I don't think we do it half as well as we might. We, we, all, we all know that mental health is the poor, poor, poor cousin of physical health, both of which are sort of amorphous blobs and we've kind of overly characterised mental health and physical health. But we all know, um, uh, give, give, you some number, give you some numbers, um, look at the Global Burden of Disease study, um, about 18% of, of uh, all illness is mental illness of one type or another. Um, if you want to look at the NHS budget, it's about 13% of the NHS budget is, 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 me is mental health or in its orientation. So we know we underinvest. Um, and we know we underinvest in uh, in children compared to adults. Um, uh, um, uh, and we know the return on investment is 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 big and lifelong. Um, we want to do better. Um, we have many skilled individuals who are trying pretty hard to do some good things in that space. We've got lots of people talking uh, to, to, to talking about and doing good things around trauma informed practice in all sorts of spaces and places at the moment. Um, um, but but if we really 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 want to go to town on it, we need to to not almost criminally underinvest in children's mental health system and by that i don't just mean cams and the sort of the pointy end of children's mental health i mean the whole of the ch children's mental health system um uh, but th th therein lies policy choices um and, and if we go there we need to be mindful of what gives um and, and you own it to be honest i'm very 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 happy to own it but, but we do need to be we do need to kind of make those willful policy choices
we fall forward to we're talking about 10 years of inefficient mental health provision became the thing mm. the oh uh, it's 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 messed it's messed everything up yeah um, yeah yeah i agree completely it's messed up it's messed up everything Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone who's been here in the audience today and, and also online. And, and great that we, we've reached Aberdeen as well. Um, <laughs> I know it's sort of been reading over the weekend sort of really hard public health issues in, in that city as well. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, for those who are here, um, there, there are some refreshments outside and hope we can carry on the excellent discussion but in the, in the usual i wonder if we can thank greg in the usual way for an absolutely and excellent first class presentation thank you very much greg and there were a lot of on the screen oh, there as well. were. Yes. there's no there's no wine for you on screen i'm, I'm sorry about